Boris Karloff, an iconic figure, became indelibly intertwined with the character of Frankenstein, forever etching his name in the annals of fright. For nearly seven decades, the image of Frankenstein's monster has pervaded the collective consciousness, firmly planting Karloff as an immortal symbol of popular culture. Born on November 23, 1887, in the tranquil suburb of Camberwell, London, Young Karloff emerged as the youngest among a brood of nine siblings. His father, Edward Pratt, dedicated a significant portion of his life to the British colonial government in India, serving as a salt tax administrator. Through his father's three marriages, Karloff's mother, Eliza, entered the picture as the third wife. Intriguingly, tales have speculated that Eliza, hailing from an Indian background, may have contributed to Karloff's strikingly dusky complexion. A mere year after Karloff's birth, his father departed, leaving the responsibility of raising the child largely in the hands of his stepsister, Emma. Meanwhile, some of Karloff's elder brothers followed in their father's footsteps, immersing themselves in the British civil service and embarking on journeys to India. It was assumed that young Karloff would do the same. Karloff's interest at school ran more to sports and music than study, however. The stage beckoned him in 1896, marking his debut in a school production of Cinderella. Cricket held a special place in his heart, and this fervor for the game remained with him throughout his entire life. Karloff's educational journey led him from Einfield Grammar School to Merchant Taylor School and eventually to Uppingham School in London. Balancing his academic pursuits with dedication, he secured admission to King's College at the University of London in 1907. While his studies paved the way for a potential future in Britain's diplomatic corps, Karloff's true passion lay in the theatrical realm. He yearned for a career on stage, but his family scorned the notion, dismissing it as a mere folly. In 1909, frustration overwhelmed him as poor grades and an insurmountable restlessness took hold. Determined to leave his homeland, Karloff resorted to a coin toss to determine his destination, Canada or Australia. Fortune favored the former, and in May 1909, he set foot on Canadian soil in Montreal. The break of dawn found him herding horses in a field, having secured employment as a humble farmhand. Progressing westward, Karloff embarked on a journey through western Canada, traversing from Banff, Alberta, to Vancouver, British Columbia. To sustain his nomadic existence, he took on various odd jobs, including digging racetracks, building streetcar tracks, and shoveling coal. Fate smiled upon Karloff as he secured a position on a survey crew with the esteemed British Columbia Electric Company. This newfound role not only brought him a salary increase, but also an improvement in working conditions. Yet, his heart still yearned for the elusive dream of becoming an actor. News of an opportunity with a troupe known as the Gene Russell Players reached his ears, prompting him to embark on a train journey to Kamloops, British Columbia, for an audition. In his quest to establish a stage identity, Karloff embraced the name Boris Karloff, citing its connection to his mother's ancestral lineage. According to Scott Allen Nolan's book, Boris Karloff, he whimsically claimed that the name Boris materialized from out of the cold Canadian air. Armed with alleged stage experience from England, he successfully secured a role within the troupe. However, the astute manager soon discerned the truth and slashed his salary in half. Undeterred, Karloff embarked on a theatrical adventure across Canada, captivating audiences with the Gene Russell players for two eventful years. Alas, their journey met an abrupt halt when a fierce tornado wreaked havoc in Saskatchewan. Undeterred by the sudden setback, Karloff cast his lot with another troop, the St. Clair Players. Though this endeavor proved scarcely more profitable, Karloff nostalgically recounted the challenging mornings that involved cooking breakfast by frying an egg on an inverted electric iron nestled between a Gideon Bible and a bedpost. Yet, the St. Clair players ventured across borders, and in October 1913, Karloff ventured into the United States for the first time, entering via North Dakota and traversing the vast expanse of the upper Midwest. As he embarked on a nomadic existence, 
Karloff fluidly transitioned between departures and reunions with the St. Clair Group while seeking opportunities with various theatrical stock companies, all the while scraping by to sustain his peripatetic life across the nation. When World War I broke out, Karloff volunteered to join the British Army, but was rejected because of a heart murmur. The St. Clair players sputtered to a halt for good in 1917, but by that time they had reached Los Angeles, California, landing Karloff at the doorstep of the growing film industry. Amidst his professional pursuits, Karloff's personal life saw its share of twists and turns. In 1920, he exchanged vows with musician Montana Lorena Williams, embarking on a new chapter of marital bliss. However, his previous marriage to actress Olive de Wilton had concluded in divorce sometime after the year 1912. The intricacies of love led Karloff down different paths as he entered into matrimony with dancer Helene Vivian Soli in 1924, followed by Los Angeles librarian Dorothy Stein in 1930. Ultimately, it was English-born Evelyn Hope Helmore who became his life partner in 1946, cementing a union that transcended time and place. In the late 1920s, Carlos' path intersected with that of Lon Chaney Sr., a renowned star in the realm of silent film horror. This fateful encounter proved to be a turning point for Karloff, as Chaney offered him invaluable encouragement. Taking the advice to heart, Karloff fearlessly embraced roles that capitalized on his gaunt and unsettling appearance. His career began to ascend when he secured a part in Howard Hawks' Scarface in 1931, which opened doors to new opportunities. Bela Lugosi declined the role to work on another film, but Karloff was given the role instead, and he quickly rose to fame. The movie was a huge commercial hit and started a trend for horror movies that lasted for most of the 1930s and was quickly regarded as a masterpiece. With the help of Boris Karloff's performance, the movie has stood the test of time well over three quarters of a century. Heavy asphalt shoes and many pounds of makeup on Karloff gave the monster his distinctive walk. Karloff inked a contract with Universal Studios in 1932 securing a substantial salary of $750 per week. As his star continued to rise, fueled by subsequent hits such as The Mask of Fu Manchu, 1932, and The Black Cat, 1934, alongside Lugosi, his weekly earnings swelled to $3,750. Karloff's prolific outputs became evident as he graced the screen in nine films in 1932 alone. While the quality of his works varied, his ability to deliver captivating performances and refined variations on the persona he established through Frankenstein remained a constant. As life continued to evolve for Karloff, he and his wife Dorothy bid farewell to their humble abode in Laurel Canyon, which they fondly referred to as a shack. Their journey led them through a series of progressively more luxurious dwellings until they found themselves in a magnificent mansion nestled in the serene Coldwater Canyon area. Here, Karloff could indulge his deep love for gardening, cultivating his oasis. Alongside his green thumb, Karloff nurtured a collection of peculiar pets, ranging from a tortoise and a parrot to egg-laying chickens, a cow named Elsie, a hefty 400-pound pig, and a handful of beloved dogs, whose names playfully included Angus Day and Silly Bitch. Despite his triumphs, Karloff remained rooted in compassion, becoming an advocate for the welfare of fellow actors who toiled in the trenches. In 1933, he played a pivotal role as a co-founder of the Screen Actors Guild Union. While the enduring legacy of Frankenstein brought both amusement and affection to Karloff, he grappled with the decision to delve into sequels that could potentially diminish the impact of the original film. Ultimately, he yielded to the allure of one sequel, Bride of Frankenstein, in 1935, and another, Son of Frankenstein, in 1938, a year that also marked the birth of his cherished daughter, Sarah. Post-war, Karloff's filmography continued to expand, but his presence on radio and television gained increasing recognition. In 1949, he embarked on a new venture as the host of the radio program starring Boris Karloff, a role that seamlessly transitioned to television in the early 1950s. Demonstrating his enduring appeal to younger audiences, 
Karloff embarked on two projects in 1950, the radio show Boris Karloff's Treasure Chest and the Broadway production of Peter Pan. These ventures carved a successful path for Karloff in his later years, solidifying his position as an entertainer cherished by children. In 1951, Karloff and his wife Evelyn relocated to New York, eventually taking up residence in the Dakota apartment building. Throughout his life, Karloff's passion for performing never waned, fueling his spirit with boundless joy and vitality. This fervor persisted until his final days, as he tirelessly engaged in acting endeavors. Breaking free from the confines of horror, Karloff expanded his repertoire, captivating audiences on Broadway with his compelling performance in The Lark in 1955, earning him a Tony Award nomination. A broadcast of this remarkable production became an annual tradition, endearing Karloff to the baby boomer generation almost as much as his iconic portrayal of Frankenstein. Despite his deep connection to the United States, Karloff never pursued American citizenship. In his twilight years, he resided in London alongside his beloved wife, periodically returning to the United States for concentrated bursts of work on various projects. One notable achievement during this phase was his involvement in the 1967 film Targets, helmed by director Peter Bogdanovich. In this thought-provoking production, Karloff portrayed an aging horror film star who yearned to retire, disillusioned by a real world more terrifying than any movie. Even in the face of declining health, Karloff tenaciously pursued his craft, and his final film, Chamber of Fear, 1968, was created in Mexico. A devoted smoker for many years, Karloff's habit eventually caught up with him, resulting in emphysema that left only half of one lung functioning. In 1968, he contracted bronchitis, necessitating his hospitalization at University College Hospital. Tragically, on February 2, 1969, at the age of 81, Karloff succumbed to pneumonia while receiving care at King Edward VII Hospital in Midhurst, Sussex. Goodbye and rest in peace, legendary actor Boris Karloff.